Hello, and welcome to the podcast Still Standing, where I interview inspiring people who have overcome challenges. My name is Shannon, and I'm so happy to have you here. I'm passionate about this podcast and this project. In I'm very hopeful that it will bring hope and inspiration to people who are struggling and uh, a feeling of not being alone for people who have been through really tough things and made it out on the other side. And I really just want to inspire people by sharing inspiring people and their stories of hope and recovery through all kinds of trauma. So today I have chills. I'm so happy to have with me Chaplain Sai Ali. And welcome, Sai. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. I'm thrilled to have you. I'm going to tell you a little bit. Oh, my my pleasure. I am going to tell you about Sai, and then we're going to have him tell you all about himself. But uh, a little bio is that Sai Ali, a security executive and ordained minister and chaplain, stands as a protector. He pioneered the first corporate security program in the cannabis industry and shielded figures like Al Gore, Colin Powell, and Desmond Tutu. Beyond personal protection for diplomats and CEOs, he assumed a vital role in 2020, the spiritual protector. I love that. An ordained minister, Sai aids those battling suicide, depression, and PTSD, battles he's, he's faced himself, which I love. I think that's the only way we can really Absolutely. effectively hold space for other people is to yes. say, hey, I'm not... I know what that's like, so I really appreciate that. Known as the chiseled chaplain, he openly discusses mental health. Thank you for doing that, Sai. He serves as a chaplain for VTC and an, is it Elevo? Alevo, Alevo yes. Alevo, Alevo site success manager. Sai's journey leads him to the spiritual protector's mantle. And Sai has a book that I'd like to share with you, and we're going to talk about Show show it on screen, if you will. It's called uh, Out of the Storm, which is his own personal journey. And we'll have links to where you can order the book. So, Sai, welcome. I'm grateful that you're here today and, and have shown up to uh, Thank participate. You. I, I know you and I have been planning this for a while, so I'm glad we finally, uh, finally got too. together. I, I kind of dropped the ball. I got overwhelmed, but I'm so glad you're, oh, for your you're patience. Um, so, Sai, tell me about yourself. Tell me about your life. For, starting from little Sai, when you're just a little nugget, and anything about your background you're willing to share would be wonderful. Yeah, I don't really, the, the book really is a memoir, so I didn't, yeah. it's not a full-blown autobiography, but I grew up uh, just north of Pittsburgh, PA, a little small steel town by the name of Farrell, PA, um, which is big back when I was growing up. The steel industry was huge back in uh, western Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area, so I literally grew up right across the street from a steel mill that ran pretty much the length of our town. So it was funny when you see uh, pictures of Pittsburgh, uh, when the street lights come on during the daytime, like back in the day, it's really legit because of the smoke and the soot. I mean, it was just, but I, we didn't know anything else. We yeah. didn't know, you know, we didn't know anything different growing up, uh, you know, just literally a, a half a block from a, a major steel mill. So uh, growing up, I was just a normal kid. I was really an, into aviation at a young age. I was an av geek. I wanted to be a pilot. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but I did, I went about it the, 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 a different way. I should have gone. I went into the Air Force right out of high school. I played basketball. I was really into sports in high school. Pretty normal childhood. I didn't get to travel a whole lot. Uh, but once I graduated from high school in 1979 and went into the Air Force, it was game on after that, Shannon. I mean, it was just circling the globe, you know, not just with the military, but my protection time and working for the Olympics and things like that. But it was absolutely a normal childhood. My mom and dad got divorced at a young age. So that was kind of traumatic. So I kind of write about that in a book because I got divorced. So my kids probably went through the same things that I went through, wondering, you know, was it me or was I responsible? The things that kids ask, you know, when your mom and dad get divorced. But overall, I mean, I was able to pretty much overcome those things. Uh, I was in the military for a total of about 10 years. I went in right out of high school, Shannon, and I went to San Antonio. That was like the first long flight I had had going from Pittsburgh to San Antonio. Uh, and then I was down there for all of my basic training, my police training, 
And then my first assignment was Bitburg, Germany. So as a kid, more or less, I kind of grew up in Europe. I mean, it was like a, a young kid with a little nice BMW just cut loose in Europe. Just, I mean, so I got to see a lot of Europe and, and really enjoyed my time over there. So I spent about seven years in the military. Then I got married, got divorced, uh, got into professional wrestling. I mean, there's there's a lot. There's a lot of moving parts to my life. So that's why I wasn't compelled to do an autobiography because I didn't want my readers to come away exhausted, Shannon. I really <laughs> did. And I was really mindful of how this would be read. And I tried to concentrate on my struggles and overcoming the struggles, but uh, got out the military and then went right into professional wrestling. I was in, when I was on leave, I was in Denver, like in 1985. And I met these professional wrestlers at a bar at the old Stapleton International Airport in Denver. And I was an active uh, powerlifter. I was competing in powerlifting and traveling throughout Europe and the U.S. and met these wrestlers. And we, over a couple of drinks, maybe quite a few drinks, one of them suggested that I reach out to uh, this professional wrestling trainer in Connecticut because I was contemplating staying in or getting out. Uh, and then I just really got lured into professional wrestling. So that was how I transformed from the military into professional wrestling. And being that I was a power lifter, I had pretty good size. I wasn't a huge guy, but I if I weighed 200 pounds, I looked like I was much heavier just because of the muscle density. So uh, professional wrestling was the most fun that I've ever had with anything in life. I mean, getting to play a bad guy and having people pay to come see you and playing like the Iraqi assassin. I had all my head garb. I had the prayer rug. And it was, he was a dastardly heel. And, and I enjoyed playing that. And then like in the Midwest or like in the middle of West Virginia, uh, I talk about it a little bit in a book about, you know, how voiceless the fans were when you play like a, a Middle Eastern heel, a gimmick. And, and the, some of the things that were shouted at me. I had to go look at a dictionary and actually pull up. So it, but it was a lot of fun. I, I did that for probably about 15 years. But the thing uh, that happened is I had numerous concussions. Uh, professional wrestling is, it's a show. Don't get me wrong. And the outcome is preordained, but everything in between, when you have guys that are over 200 pounds throwing each other around, and it's not a trampoline that we're falling on. It's, you know, rings can be pretty stiff and pretty hard on the body, but uh, I had, way too many concussions and like the last concussion i had was in 2000 and i was in upstate new york uh, doing a wrestling tour and i had my guy who was in the ring with me i wanted him to do a pile driver and it was on top of a baseball dugout and he didn't want to do it but i for i just pretty much forced him to do it and a little bit at the top of my scalp was exposed between his legs and when he did the pile driver it was i just everything just i blacked out basically but yet the adrenaline kind of kept me moving in the match. And when we got back to the dressing room, I couldn't remember like the last 20 minutes of the match. And the promoter got really worried. He called my then wife and said, hey, look, Cy had a really bad concussion. So when I got back to the D.C. area, I went to my doctor and he basically gave me an ultimatum. And he said, look, he was like, I treat NFL football players who have helmets and they have their brains are at least covered with the helmet. He was like, you're out here. You got nothing. If you have another one of these, you could die in a ring. And that was enough for me to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to put this down. But that was a big regret of mine that I didn't leave professional wrestling on my own terms. I had to leave because of the amount of concussions I had. Uh, and then, like I said, you know, my life just kind of kept transforming. After I left wrestling, I really just jumped in both feet into the security industry and I found uh, a company in Washington, D.C. who hired me on as a consultant. And that was 20, almost 26 years of being on the road as an executive and dignitary protection specialist. I also worked at several Olympic Games. I worked in uh, Beijing in 2008. I worked in Rio de Janeiro in 2016. Um, it just got to do everything. I worked for the World Bank, IMF meetings in Washington, D.C., and coordinated the, the you know, the uh, first responding response and things like that. 
I did. I was assigned to Vice President Gore. I was assigned to a former Russian president, Mikhail Gorbachev, um, British Prime Minister Majors, uh, Polish President Chisnitsky. Uh, so just a lot. It was like a blur of 20 years of crisscrossing the globe and being in all kind of time zones. But I, I realized that I was battling depression. And it wasn't until I stopped drinking in 2020, I got a DUI. And I was so disappointed in myself that I had gotten arrested that I, I was, my pride was hurt, Shannon. And I told my friends that night, March 1st, 2020, I told them I'm never drinking again. And I know they laughed because I would have laughed at myself uh, because of the history of drinking and being like the life of the party. I, I stopped that night and then that's when the, the spiritual journey kicked in. Uh, God had, he made, you know, he told me because back in Denver in, in 2015, well, I lost my dad in 2005. I lost my father-in-law in, in 2009, and I got divorced in 2014. So those three incidents there, along with the wrestling things that I still harbored, I don't really consider that much necessarily a trigger. Uh, but the three, uh, my father passing, my father-in-law, who was a beloved Presbyterian minister, and to call him an in-law is a disservice because, you know, my uh, wife's parents were like my own parents. So it was like a double hit of watching them two pass away within a couple of few years of each other. And then I just basically checked out. I just jumped and put myself into my work. I was barely around my family. I was spending months at a time on the road. And I just the marriage just began to dissolve. And I pretty much had checked out. I didn't realize how depressed I was. It wasn't until I started writing the book that I realized how bad I suffered and how much help I needed. And I was unwilling to reach out to anybody. And that's the thing with folks to try to take their lives or folks to do, they don't feel like they have a support system, even though you have family and you hear people, Shannon, say, oh, I wish I would have known. I could have been there for you. It's, it's, it's easier said than done. If that was the case, I think a lot more people wouldn't be taking their lives because people who say that would actually be there and know which questions to ask you. Uh, but for me, I, I had planned this. I planned it. It was April 18th, 2015 in my office. And I'm the director of corporate security for Dixie Brands. Uh, so I went to work that Saturday morning because uh, we did make, you know, we made edible products and things like that. Uh, I, so I would go work. I'd go to work every Saturday. I was pumping, you know, 70, 75 hour weeks just so I can work and not have to be at home and look at myself in the mirror and, and not know who's looking back at me. So I just sunk myself into work and I had planned that day. Um, and then, so when everybody left, I checked out the facility because in my office with all the cameras, all the alarms, everything, I was the one solely responsible for the security and safety of, of all those employees at that headquarters. And so when everybody left, I got in my office, I had a big jug of gray goose I didn't even open it up, Shan. And I was like, you know, I'm courageous. I can do this without anything. I don't need any drugs. I don't need any alcohol. And I do believe that's when God was like, okay, I think he's going to do this. I mean, if he's not going to drink first, maybe that would at least hold him off. But I, I was resolute that I was going to take my life that day. So I looked behind me and I saw my kids' pictures on my shelf behind me and I moved their pictures because I was analytical. I, I wanted to know where the blood spray was going to go. I didn't want it to go on my kids' pictures. I knew because it was my office, and my office was the most secure office in the, in the facility, it would take a few days for folks to find that spare key. And by the time they got to me, rigor mortis would have set in, and it would have just, they wouldn't have seen me like right after I took my life. So as I, I had my Glock 19 in my mouth, and I had a round in the chamber. I had my finger on the trigger guard. And just as when I thought I put the last bit of pressure on my Glock, everything in my office went pitch black. So my initial res response was like, okay, that was easy. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just took my life. I didn't feel anything. Maybe this is what it feels like when, you know, you, 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 you die. 
Um, but as it was still, there was nothing. I mean, you, this is a big facility. You got an HVAC system. I've got 75 cameras on a large console that's up on my wall. I had my laptop on. I was playing music. You can hear things. That, you know, even though I was the only one in the building, the building is, it's noisy. It's just from the HVAC and everything else. Um, so I was like, okay, maybe I'm in some sort of purgatory. Where where am I? Am I dead? And at that point, Shannon, I can feel the hair. I couldn't see myself, but I can feel like a static electricity, like what was running through my body. And I explained in the book that, you know, as a kid, we were playing baseball. And back then we didn't have the radar alerts, you know, to tell people to get off a baseball field. You know, you just got to use common sense, which we obviously didn't have. And we're out there playing baseball and our outfield fence was like an aluminum style fence. And right before the lightning hit, everybody felt the electric charge in their body. They felt their hair. And that's what I felt in my office. And I was like, wow. So I'm feeling that it, uh, I must still be alive, but I can't see anything. I can't I, I can't hear anything. And at that point, I felt this overwhelming presence of two individuals in the office with me. One was like crouched on t by my left leg, like in a crouch position, like a coach would be coaching somebody up. And the other person was off my right shoulder and had their hand on my shoulder. And I recognized I could smell the aromas, which I thought was odd because it's, it's like I knew who it was. I'm like, what is, wait a minute, my dad is here. He's crouched on my side. My father-in-law has his hand. I know his grip. He played football. He was a college football coach. I know when he shook my hand, I know that grip anywhere. So they were in this space with me at this time. And my father-in-law, I never forget. He said, son, do you realize what you're going to leave in your wake? And before I could even answer him, an old style projector screen just flashed in front of me. And I watched like my whole life at being born. That's the autobiography. I basically got to see my whole life during this time period from being born to my kids being born and all the good things, all the bad things. And then when I thought it was over, I watched myself in my office and I watched myself take my own life. And I'm watching this and I'm squirming. And but I can't move off the chair. It's like, oh, you're going to watch this. And then I just watch my body go back and I watch my body slump. And then after a period of time, my coworkers had finally got the key and they went in and then they saw my body and then they were just distraught. I mean, it was basically, they wouldn't let people come in and then they eventually took my body out. And then I watched as my mom who was still alive back then, she was notified, my sister was notified, my kids were notified. Everybody was just distraught, Shannon. And I'm watching this on the screen. My kids had to go in and out of rehab. And you, when you take your life, there's so many unanswered questions. And I didn't write anything. So that just tells you how distraught I was. I didn't even have the wherewithal. And I thought, again, I'm an analytical thinker. I failed to even write a note as far as to why I did this. So my family was just befuddled and just couldn't wrap their arms around why Cy, who was this successful security executive and had done all these wonderful things, would take his life. Uh, and then both my father and my father-in-law asked me, they said, is this what you really want? By this time, Shannon, I, when, when, and I said, no, I, I muttered no. And as soon as I did that, I saw, I can hear the HVAC and I watched each one of my cameras illuminate one by one and then there was music playing and in, in the band one of my favorite bands is called incognito their song out of the storm was playing on my uh my computer and that's how i came up with the with the title of the book out of the storm uh and, and i walked away that day and i could not i couldn't figure out what had happened i i wasn't spiritual enough i didn't have any faith at that point to really realize who orchestrated that or what orchestrated that. So for five years, I kept that deep in my soul. I never wanted to discuss it because I couldn't explain it. I know I wasn't drinking. I know I wasn't on drugs. I had urinated on myself. 
when I when the lights came back on, I was almost like sticking to my chair. And it's a good thing that I didn't eat because I probably would have defecated as well. I was that afraid. I could not figure out what was going on. First, I thought it was like a really crude joke that maybe some of my employees were playing on me, but there was nobody in that facility. It was completely locked down. Uh, and so I walked away from that day. I, I wasn't still understanding, but I never, ever had the urge after that incident to take my life again. The suicidal thoughts were gone, but yet I continued to battle with alcohol abuse. I really wasn't into substances and things like that, uh, but I was still a big drinker. And then I continued on for five years and I was up in the Pacific Northwest and I got that DUI. And I told my friends that night, I'm like, I'm never drinking again. And I have not touched a drink since March 1st, 2020. I picked up my mom's Bible that my sister had given to me on a, when I, on a visit to Pittsburgh. And I started reading. And I just concentrated on reading the Bible. I mean, I, I, I spent a lifetime as a, I was a Catholic. I was in Catholic school, Christian, being around a family and friends that are ministers. But I never really had true faith, Shannon. And when I started reading the Bible, I do believe that God was like, okay, I kind of like what I'm seeing here. Let's, you know, keep this up. And then like a week into my sobriety, uh, he basically approached me again when I was sleeping. I heard this loud thud and I, our friends, we were joking, being up in the Pacific Northwest, we were joking about my, Mount Rainier. And if it would erupt, then what would happen if Mount Rainier would erupt, would there be earthquakes? So I, I thought, wow, maybe this is an earthquake. So I walked around the basement where I was living at and there was nothing. My friends living upstairs had, you know, Belgian mountain walls. They have police dogs. So the dogs weren't barking at all. And I was like, wow. So I went and I sat at the edge of my bed and I lit a candle up. And then I felt the same thing of, of the hair on my arm standing up. And all I heard was, you need to start writing. And I was like inquisitive and it was God saying, hey, that was me. I came for you. I have you purposed. I got work for you to do. So that's how I got, I started taking seminary classes. And I don't even think God was looking at me to go to this area. He just wanted me to write about the mental health aspect mm -hmm. in hopes that it would help others. But I started taking seminary courses and I got my chaplaincy degree. And I started working in the Pacific Northwest as a chaplain at a cancer treatment facility. And this was during the pandemic. So when I was going through my training, I couldn't partner up with another chaplain because it was the quarantine. So I had to wait for that to get over. And then my friend, who's an oncologist, she said, we don't have a chaplain. Why don't you come up and you can be, you know, like our volunteer chaplain. She was like, I don't know if we have money to pay you, but if we can get funding, you know, we'll, we'll pay you, but at least volunteer, you, you can get your feet wet. And we desperately need a chaplain to work with our, our cancer treatment patients. So that's how the ministry started. Uh, then I just, I still wandered around. I was a nomad. I really was, Shannon. I, I lived all over the country. All of my memorabilia from wrestling and my corporate plaques and things are just scattered around the country because I just couldn't sit still. It was just like I was a nomadic. And um, I left Pacific Northwest in September of 2021. And I went back to Pittsburgh because a friend of mine suggested that um, I wrote a small article called Out of the Storm and he read it and he was like, we should do like a documentary. Maybe we can get some funds together. So I went back to Pittsburgh in 21. We never got the funding, but I worked with a nonprofit and worked as a youth mentor at a high school in Pittsburgh, actually Penn Hills, which is a, a suburb of Pittsburgh. And that's how I got started working with young people. And then, I, but I just knew that I wasn't gonna be in Pittsburgh. Something was guiding me out to California. So I came out to California in April of 2022, and I was gonna work with this security company. But as soon as I got there, I knew in my heart, this is not, this is not gonna work. They didn't have the funds to put me in housing. So I basically slept in my office for two months. So as far as the government was concerned, I was officially homeless. And this company came to me on a Sunday and told me that they were shutting down. They needed my company car and they could give me a plane ticket to go back to Pittsburgh or the Pacific Northwest. But I told them, no, I said, I'm staying in California. 
they couldn't figure it out. So I stayed one night at a Best Western in Marina, California. And then I checked myself in the next day to, at the Veterans Transition Center. It's basically a homeless shelter for veterans. And it's on the old Fort Ord, uh, which is here in Monterey County. Uh, so I didn't have a job, didn't have a car. I found myself homeless. And I always joke with my friends, I'm one step between being a millionaire and one step between homeless. I was hoping for the former and not the latter, but I ended up homeless. And that started this whole ordeal, not an ordeal, but this whole journey in California. I got to mentor and minister to other veterans like myself, Shannon. And I found out there's veterans that got it worse than me. One of my housemates was a retired Army Ranger. He did six tours between Iraq and Afghanistan. Was very, very troubled. You could tell he was. And he was a great chef and he worked at a restaurant. So when he would come back at night, he and I, he would make, he would bring gyros and we would just sit and talk. And one night I asked him, I was like, you know what? How many lives do you think you took over there? And he looked at me and he said, you know what? He was like, I just numb myself to that whole ordeal. And he said, Sigh, I looked at it like, they want to kill me? See, so he's like, I have to take them because if not, they're going to kill me. They're going to kill my teammates. So that started the conversation with him. And you know, I was feeling bad for myself, Shannon, because I was homeless. But God basically said, look, you're a chaplain, right? I said, yes. He said, well, go be a chaplain. There's reasons why I have you here. You don't need the sob story. You're here. Go talk to these veterans, men or women, and all of them. It was like a housing area that used to be Fort Ord. It was the old like military housing. So I, they, VTC gave me an office, and I was able to work with a lot of veterans and one of my housemates who's like 80 years old he had some traffic infractions and he couldn't drive so i could drive i would drive his car to these appointments and i was looking for a job i mean to get my little 300 for the state of california i had to work in delray oaks at the public works division and I, I worked in a park cleaning up the bathrooms and that's how i got my 300 a month to at least pay my phone bill and just try to hang on but I answered there on Indeed, there was an ad for a youth coach in Salinas, and it was this company called Alevo. And that means elevate in Spanish. They do after school. I mean, they do these social emotional learning curriculums for school districts throughout the state. We're as far as Reading and all the way down to uh, Imperial, LA, San Diego, San Francisco, Sacramento, we're at all these school districts. And I became a youth coach. And my, my friend gave me, <coughs> excuse me, he gave me his car so I can, you know, go do the interview. And I got the job and I became a youth coach and things seemed to like just turn. Uh, I got promoted to site success manager, but I was in a classroom with these uh, TK, transitional kindergarten and kindergarten. And it was like a scene out of kindergarten cop with Arnold. I'm in the classroom. I'm looking at the kids. They're looking at me. They're looking at my arms. And one kid, I guess he got anointed. They asked me, Coach Sai, how old are you? I said, take a guess. He said, 100. I was shot. My little pride was just gone, but I fell in love with those kids. And you could tell that they were drawn to me and I was drawn to them. And though they were young, I just think from a spirit standpoint, they were drawn to me somehow, some way. And I just, it became wildly successful. And then I got promoted so now I'm a site success manager. I deal with all the principals in my school district. I'm like the customer service rep. So I go in and talk with the principals. If they don't like what we're doing or what our coaches and youth coaches are doing, they come to me. So I got promoted, but I still, still love being with the kids. Uh, I, with His Grace Ministries, I found a church home. I got promoted there. I'm like the lead of usher and head of the greeters. I preach maybe like once every couple of months or so. Uh, things have just turned. And I believe coming here, it was my line in the sand. This is where God said, look, this is where you're going to be. You've moved around too much. There's literally sand where, where I'm at because we're, you know, Fort Ord is like right on the Pacific Ocean. So there's sand, there's sand dunes around where I was living. And this is how 
the transformation started of uh, being this youth coach and being this chaplain around uh, nursing homes here in Monterey County. Uh, and then I just finally just said, okay, I want to get this book done with. And I wrote about it. I wrote about, you know, what led up to the moment that I had that pistol in my mouth. What were the trigger points? And I was able through my writing, it was therapeutical, Shannon. It really was. Um, and that's where I'm at now. I mean, it's it 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 was a great transformation. I it's just too many things to discuss for one interview or for even a book. And again, I didn't want my readers to be exhausted from an autobiography. So the book itself is only 160 pages, but it covers the areas that need to be covered. And I, my biggest goal for the book is I hope that somebody can read it. And if they're not affected by it, they might know somebody who is. So that book can be the gift that keeps on giving. That's my goal. I want it to be impactful. If I listen to my publishing company, they think it's going to be a New York best bestseller. I really don't care about that, Shannon. I just want it to be impactful. So yeah. that's the short version of a very uh, yeah. long story. You told it so well, and I'm I'm sure I know that the book will be successful because you are a great storyteller and very charismatic and very insightful. Um, and I have so many things to touch on. Um, so my first question, just to, to clarify for people who may not understand exactly what happened um, during your spiritual experience, did you actually pull the trigger or was it like you thought you did, but you didn't? I and, thought I did. But you didn't, right? Because, But you, I, but yeah, but there was an intervention there, from there spirit. There was absolutely yeah. an intervention. In five years, Shannon, I pondered on that. I wasn't going to tell anybody because I was like, man, I don't know if I would believe that. But what had happened there? So in, in, being this in, a, a corporate security director, I thought if that got out, you know, career wise, that might be an ender for me because right. most people thought when I took the job in the cannabis industry, that was a career ender, but it actually been, yeah. it was one of the better jobs that I had done. And I was able to do that while I was severely depressed. So there's those people out there, Shannon, who in the day they seem well, they get home at night and they're by themselves and they look in the mirror and you just see a figure who you don't know. And that's the people that we really need to find because exactly. they're playing, they're acting like they're okay, but they're really not. And that's the people I think that we lose. Yeah. You know, they don't tell anybody. So, and I, that's what I wanted. One of the things I wanted to touch on is uh, it's been on my mind too, because uh, you know, sometimes there is a little dis um, spirituality and, and religion can some, I know not everyone's on board, but I, I sure. am a, a medium. So yeah. I have a lot of clients and a lot lately who have lost children to suicide. And I would say, oh, all three, just this week, three of them, all of them, wow. they knew, they knew that their kids were struggling as all kids do. I mean, like it's high school, college, it's a tough time. Yes. None of the, and all were boys. And this is something else I wanted to touch mm, on, especially yes. with men. Um, their kids didn't say anything. No. Or two of them, their kids, I, I don't know about the third, but two of them, it was an impulsive decision. They were otherwise functional. They had things to look forward to. There were things yes. that were going well. They had just furnished their new apartments. They, two days later, gone or right at Christmas. And the came from loving families. These were kids without any familial trauma. Just wow. kids that were suffering with depression, but yes. none of them wanted to worry their families. None of them wanted to ask for help. And they just left thinking, oh, it'll be easier for everyone, which obviously is not the it's case. So such the opposite, Shannon. It really it's is. Such the opposite. And it's so common. We all go through periods of yes. depression, whether you have clinical depression or clinical anxiety or bipolar disorder. Life is really, really tough. And so I'd love to touch on that and how important what you're doing is because this is why we talk about it because so many people are afraid to talk about it. And I think there's an emphasis on especially men and, and girls and yes. women, but especially men who are not encouraged that you're supposed to be strong. You're supposed to be able yes. to handle things. And um, I just, it, it's, and men are not often encouraged to be emotional. I think we're leaning there now, but Tell, I'd love to hear your thoughts and not really a question, but just to speak on that. 
Well, it, for me, it's a generational thing. Yeah. Uh, because growing up, I remember my parents or grandparents when I'm getting a spank and say, don't you shed a tear. Yeah. So I conditioned myself as a kid to not show emotion when I really wanted to cry. Yeah. And I and, and I don't know if that's if that was uh, a necessarily a, a, an African American, a black thing, or a white thing. But I, even a lot of my older friends say, "Hey, it was the same way in our house." So it wasn't necessarily a, a culture thing. But growing up at that point, men or boys weren't allowed to show their emotion. So when my grandmother died in 1973, I was really close to my grandmother because when my mom and dad divorced. My grandmother lived on the bottom floor and we lived up top. So she really looked after me. And I was really devastated when she passed, but I refused to let myself cry. But yet you can feel it in your soul. It's just grinding like you just want to let it out. And I just was conditioned. And I grew up to become a man who was conditioned to not discuss my emotions, to not show emotions. And I think that's a big thing. But I thought I felt I was disappointed to hear you say that because I thought young people were really more more willing to discuss it. You go talk about Simone Biles when, you know, she said she needed that break. Michael Phelps, when he was like, look, you know, I'm battling some things. So maybe that's just a small percent of people that are willing to talk about it. But I thought maybe young people would be more willing to say, hey. But there's still folks like me who on the peripheral seem okay. Yeah. And that's, but it's exhausting. I was so exhausted, Shannon, of being, of hiding that and trying to portray that I was okay when I knew I wasn't. I mean, I was walking in like total darkness, just trying to reach and find, you know, a light switch. And then and so I told a group, I was talking with our, our men's group and I said, imagine just shutting your eyes and just being in complete darkness and you're trying to reach for a light switch and then after a while you just say forget it i'm not and then now we're going to throw in on that floor is big gaping holes you're trying to maneuver around to try to not fall through a hole you're looking for a light switch and then you just say forget it i don't care and that, that's when you pretty much come to conclusion that you don't care if you die or not and you're going to just walk on this floor. And if you step through that hole, you just, you step through it. That's the end of you. That's the end of your life. So it's a, it's a devastating thing, but people, you know, and, and I have so many of my friends, when they read the article, they were like, oh, I wish you would have told me. And I said, well, what, what were you going to do? What were you going to do for me? How, what would you do to comfort me? So it's easy. And, and, I, and I'm not, saying that to be mean spirited with people because I do believe people mean well but they don't understand what sort of a mind frame you're in and when you're in these really dark places you just don't want to endure the pain anymore and then that's when you end it but that situation for me when I was in my office told me look the easy part is pulling the trigger what about everybody you're going to leave behind I got three kids I've got a sister, I've got a brother-in-law. My mom was still alive. I mean, my dads were gone and that, but they care about me. And that's when I got to look at my own video and see me take my life and see how devastated they were. My kids going in and out of treatment centers. That's what I think we really don't weigh that in. So I, the book, again, God told me, he was like, I said, God, people are gonna look at me, they're gonna doubt. They're going to say I was weak. He was like, do not worry. He's like, I got you there. You write because while you're writing, it's therapeutic for you. And when I was at the high school in Pittsburgh, we were there on a Saturday morning. You remember the movie, The Breakfast Club? One of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, we were, so we're in this school a Saturday morning at Penn Hills High School in Pittsburgh. And I bought these Dunkin' Donuts. And these kids, Shannon, were just so shut down. They had their hoods up over their heads. And this is an inner city school. They got their ear you know, ear pods on. And my friend, Tawana Gatewood, who was the other uh, youth mentor, she was like, Sai, you tell them about your story. Tell them. So I said, really? You think so? She was like, yeah. So I sat, we sat the kids down and I told them everything that I told you about taking my life. And the look 
on these young people's faces was like, wow. Okay, now we're interested. So, you know, they took their, their, their music off and they were engaging. And there was one female, I wanted to mention her name in my book, but she still, I still email her. She's already graduated, but she rolled up her sleeve, Shannon, and she showed me the cut marks on her arm. And I was like, wow. And I asked the director, can I share my article with these kids? And he was like, of course. So I showed her my article. She went home and she read it. And the next Saturday she came back and she was like, it feels like you're talking about me. She was like, what possessed you to write this? I said, well, this is more of a spiritual thing, but it's therapy for me when I write about this because I can, I literally have to self-assess myself. And I literally in this book, just throw it out there. It doesn't matter if people throw shade or say, oh, you were weak. You should have did this. You should have did that. I want it to be, be impactful for people. And so if, if, if a young 16-year-old at that time, if my story resonates with her, she can equate that with her own situation. I convinced her to write. I had already left for California. And Tawana Gatewood, who the other, she said, Sai, you would have loved it. She got up in front of the class and read her story. And she was like, all I could think about was you. You would have been so proud to watch her do this. Uh, so that's the sort of impact. I, I didn't think about kids early on. I just thought about veterans with PTSD and, you know, older people. But that time frame in Pittsburgh was only eight months. But it was a fruitful eight months because I realized I can deal, I can talk with kids about this. And I tried to write this book so that younger people could read it. And that's the reason why I just wanted to shorten it up because I know young people don't they, the attention span they have. You know, you got to be careful with them. But I wanted everybody of age ranges. Now I know I can't go in, el in my elementary schools and talk about that, but I believe even middle school kids, uh, I can see it. I mean, I can see when a person is battling something. I don't know if God just gave me this gift or whether kids are comfortable to come to me and say, hey, Coach Sai, you know, can I talk to you about this? But even when I was at Alevo at the elementary school, when I first started out here, I found out that there was a kindergartner who had lost his dad like three weeks before school started and he was bullying the other kids. And when I pulled him aside, because our young, our coaches are young. They're my, like younger than my youngest kid. They were like, coach Sai, can you talk to this kid? So I pulled him aside and we talked for a while. And he was like, I lost my dad. And I think he was mad at me because he left. So he couldn't process the grief thing. And I started working with him. And he went home and told his mom. So his mom came in. She was like, you coach Sai. And I thought, boy, she's mad at me for something. She was like, no. She said, Solomon told me about you, that you, were, you got him to open up. She was like, you can talk about God to him anytime. I said, thank you. But I got to be very careful in school. But I said, he opened up to me. So a handful of more kids I work with, the principal came up to me. She was like, good goodness. She was like, I got trained counselors here. She's like, you've made an impact here your first couple of weeks here. She's like, whatever you're doing, keep on doing it. You got my blessing. <laughs> so I was able to start working with younger kids. So, you know, working three years, doing end of life at a, a cancer treatment facility was hard. I mean, I love and respect chaplains for the work they do, whether it's in a hospital or a hospice, or whether you're with a police, you know, a police division, wherever you're with. <clears throat> but I had to work with folks end of life and became very good at really just listening. You know, all, all the training I had through seminary training, the, the chaplaincy, the most important thing I took away was being a good listener. And I think that's important because when people know that you're willing to listen and not just tune them out, they come to you and then they, they can lay things at your doorstep that you wouldn't believe. And, and that's how it is now, not just with working with older people and veterans who have PTSD. Our church elder, I interviewed her on a podcast and she broke it down that she tried to take her life like several years ago. So I just trying to be impactful, whether this book, you know, can serve as a lifeline to somebody. And I certainly hope that it can. I just wanted, again, to be that gift that keeps on giving. Somebody can read it and say, oh, I'm good with this, but so-and-so might need to read this. They can gift it over. I'm okay with that. And, yeah. and I believe that I'm on to something. And the fact, I, I, 
I just, it just hit me like last week that I got this book done and it was so laborish. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm I'm writing one too. And I know it's so that I broke down and just, I had to just take a break of talking about my dad's death and things like that. Uh, It's, it was laborious, but I'm so glad I was able to get it done. And it just hit me last week. I mean, I just broke down on the way from Salinas to Carmel coming back home that, man, I finally got this done. And only thing I could care less whether it's a bestseller. I really don't care. That's my publishers. If they like that, okay, good for them. And if that helps me, but I just want this to be impactful overall. That's my goal here. And that's that's my ministry. That's my platform moving forward. Yeah. And I wanted to touch on something else that the book is great and 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 podcasts and all of this is also really helpful. And also, but what's so beautiful is you showing up in person to connect one-on-one with people and to not show up as someone who's not experienced what they're going through, telling them, you know, it's like if I went into the inner city and I grew up in Westport, Connecticut with these loving parents and we were affluent and I went, my parents paid for college and, you know, a kid in the inner city isn't going to relate to that. Um, they might relate to my addiction story to some yes. degree, but they might look at me and go, this lady is not going to connect. So I was talking about this with one of my best friends who's African-American and you talked about, is it cultural? And I think, yeah, there are a lot of factors um, with uh, generational, like my dad was hit, like spanked when he was a kid in front of the whole class. And he wasn't even a bad kid, but you know, like they would spank kids in front of the entire, hit them with a paddle in front of the entire class. So he did that to me once and then sobbed afterwards and told my mom, I'll never do that again. But that was what he learned. And even today, he's the most love it. He's the best dad and I love him, but he still wasn't raised to be very effusive with his love, right? right? Like to, yep. he shows it in different ways, but it's that he'll say, I love you, but in an email or like, right. I love you or very <laughs> better. If, it's yes. like not yeah. worse. So I wanted to talk about that because uh, I said to my friend who grew up in the inner city, I'm like, Listen, I was like, I really wish that they had, and I'm sure they do, but like EMDR therapy, trauma therapy that they could bring into the inner city to bring into uh, to bring into high schools and, and kids. And he goes, Shannon, he goes, my people aren't going to go to therapy. <laughs> he goes, it's like not talked about. It's not okay to talk about. I have another friend who grew up in the inner city who I went to high school with, and she said uh, she was brain she was in a horrible accident where her best friend passed away who driving her to give birth to her child and she was severe like brain damaged and didn't know that she'd survive fortunately she and the baby survived so i'm talking to this woman and she said uh i had i started going to therapy because it was so for because ptsd and she said in my family um in my family we don't do that it's very looked down on she said in fact because I was bused into your school. We went to the like affluent uh, school in Westport, Connecticut, and she was bused in from Bridgeport. She said, my family shunned me for going to an affluent school and getting a good education. They said, you think you're better than us. And she said, when I graduated with my um, business degree, one person showed up because they were all at my cousin's get out of jail you know, party. And so he's, they wow. had just gotten out of jail. So everyone went to that instead of coming to see me get yeah. my MBA. And so there is, I think it's important too, to discuss culture because um, there is that pride and we don't, we can handle it ourselves. And so people become accustomed to just holding in trauma. And that's so much a part of our, that's a, such a bigger conversation, but it to is. see you showing up to be a mentor to people in your own community too, which is like, they can relate with you. I think that's such a big part of healing trauma is to be able to feel safe. It is. And I, I want to provide that safe space, you know, and and being it because we we were like with an after school program, I had to pick and choose my moments that I can actually pull these kids aside. Um, and, And again, our coaches are so young and I was like, you know, much older. I mean, I'm like a grandfather to these kids. You know, I was 60, you know, one, 62 being in school and working with alongside coaches that are 19 and 20. Yeah. So they don't know how to handle things like that. So they would come to me and say, Coach Zai, can you talk to so-and-so? 
and I was able to do that. I didn't know, not until I got to Pittsburgh, and, and one thing that I knew at that school uh, it was there were several shootings, and the kids were reeling, Shannon. I mean, there was like at least five shootings where they had lost schoolmates, so they were struggling, and they were looking for an opportunity or a venue to be able to talk about that. And thanks to my, you know, partner, Tawana, she was the one who said, hey, talk about it. Because I was hesitant to really tell them my story, the, my truth, the nuts and bolts of it, and go and be explicit about it and tell them that I was thinking about the blood spray and how long my body would be there before somebody would finally get the key, you know, the backup key to my office. And their eyes were like, wow, he's really willing to discuss this. This is a safe space for us so we can talk. And it was it was traumatic for them, but they were able to get it out. And, and it was emotional. Um, but, and kids, young people need that. They need that safe space. And they're looking. Shannon, when I walk in, first of all, they're looking. And they're, the kids are looking at the veins in my arms. and But yet they know that I'm going to be there as a protector. It, it, it's, it's almost like an unspoken sort of a vibe that I have with, with young people that if I'm talking with them, you're, you're okay. This is a space for you in which to talk. And, and I know, and like the principal told me, she was like, I got trained counselors here and they're not able to get to the kids like you're able to get to the kids. And I don't, that's not just because I'm a chaplain. It's maybe because I, you know, I was damaged goods. And I was able to get on the other side of that. And the deal with God was like, hey, look, I'm, you're going to walk away from this because I have your purpose, even though you don't know what it is yet. And, you know, when I walked out of my office that day, I was befuddled. But now I know, you know, how this, you know, how it looked and how it was supposed to be that I'm on the other side of it now. Uh, do I have my good and bad days? Yeah, especially you're, you've lived in L.A. These are the worst drivers <laughs> yes. in the world here. The I was an Uber drivers. driver in L.A. For, I get so bad and yeah. frustrated with I these drivers out here. That's my only yeah, drawback. Yeah, in L.A. And I, I learned in L.A. driving for uh, Lyft and Uber, it's like I had to learn to be a defensive driver. So I'm God actually a really good defensive, defensive driver. Defensive. Yeah, it's it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I have to I pray for patience on the road, but. Other than that, I, I want to make sure, and it just, you know, for the cover of the book, I put that, uh, the lighthouse, because it's funny that God would send me to a homeless shelter right on the Pacific Ocean. I mean, yeah. literally, this Fort Ord was right on the ocean here. And, and that, you know, and that's, I've always wanted my lighthouse. Now, I know they're, they're you know, unaffordable, but I always envision myself having a lighthouse. And the, the you know the thing about the lighthouse was you were able to send that light out to other ships to guide them in and there's so many lost souls out there oh my god that, you know oh, yeah this is it's so important today to be able to help people to get out of their storms and bring them back to shore and, and help them yes. just by so by writing the book i hope that that at least serves as, as some help some form of okay i was able to get through this um, we know that God doesn't save everybody. We know that he didn't save those young people. Uh, I don't know what missions he has for them, but uh, we need to be able to tell people, look, you, the easy part is pulling the trigger or taking, the, you know, overdosing or what. The hard part is about your family. There's so many unanswered questions that they'll never get to ask you. So I think it's important that we understand uh, you can take your life, but like my father-in-law told me when he was in that office with me, you realize what you're going to leave behind in your wake. Those words will always be etched in my soul. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I would love to know, too, uh, when I've been asked to share in 12-step meetings, a lot of times I talk about the things that helped me to recover from addiction. And again, not like I'm always 100% perfect, but where I was 20 years ago versus where I am today I also wanted to take my life so many times, struggled, just, just, I didn't want to be here anymore. And thank God, literally, yes. you know, the 12-step program is kind of what led me into spirituality on a much deeper level. Yeah. And so I always talk about 
it's several things. It's being of service, which you are to others. It gets you out of your own drama and helping other people. But before that, it's putting your own oxygen mask on first to make sure you're taken care of and you're loving yes. yourself and you're healing before you can heal other people. So self-care to me is one of the most important things. And I'd love to know what your journey of self-care is and how you, it, and it, whether it's spirituality or uh, exercise, whatever it is, what keeps you grounded? Well, after, after the suicide attempt, um, and I wrote about it, my, a friend of mine, who was retired, he was a retired Denver SWAT officer. He kind of helped me with the security aspect of it. Uh, after, and he didn't know that I tried to take my life, but he he called me like two weeks after that. And he wanted to, uh, he had a security company of his own and he wanted to do business in Africa. Now I have contacts all over the world. And he asked me, he was like, hey, do you know anybody in Africa? I'm like, sure. And he was like, well, can you put me in touch with somebody? So my buddy, Chris Bucus runs uh, one of the largest security firms on the continent. It's based out of Cape Town, and he has an office in Johannesburg. So I told Alex, I was like, here, I'm going to give you the name. He was like, well, can you do the formal introduction? So we actually ended up flying from Denver to South Africa, literally two weeks after I tried to take my life. And while we're on this flight, we went from Denver to LAX. We flew an airline called Etihad from LAX to Abu Dhabi, and then we flew on down into uh, Johannesburg and Cape Town. So Alex and I had a long time to talk, and he was a big dude. He was, you know, just, he was a beast in the gym, and he knew that I was a professional wrestler, and he talked to me, and he was like, dude, you need to get back into the weight room. He was like, that might help you. He Now, mind you, he didn't realize that I tried to take my life two weeks earlier, so it was very fitting that he had convinced me, so when I got back, I got a membership to a gym and I have not looked back since. So my start, my, my prepare, you know, to prepare for the spiritual part, I kind of did the physical fitness journey first. I, you know, in hindsight, maybe I should have started with the spiritual, but I started with the physical first yeah. and I noticed a difference when I started working out and I was starting to put my size that I had back on when I was a pro wrestler so, and that part made me feel very good. Uh, and again, like I said, I was scared so bad from that situation that I've never had the urge to take my life. But I started and I write in the book about the three fitness levels or four fitness levels, three for kids. Number one, spiritual. Number two, mental and emotional. Number three, uh, physical. And number four, financial for adults. If you can cover those four fitness levels, you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I, my finances were horrible. Again, I was divorced and paying like all kinds of spousal support and that. So my financial situation was always my Achilles heel. So I worked on the physical, got ordained, got the spiritual part, started writing therapy that helped my mental health. And okay, the financial thing is a work in progress. Yeah. Uh, but I'm no longer in a homeless <laughs> shelter. Thank goodness. Uh, but those are the four things. And when I talk to kids, I mean, I, I don't talk about the finance because the kids, I try to really hone in on the mental and emotional aspect. And it's funny what, that I work with Alevo because Alevo focuses on social emotional learning. You know, we take the kids, we do our community circle, you know, when we first get them, we do the temperature gauge, you know, seeing how the kids are, all of our games that we do. There's a premise behind it. Good sportsmanship. Hey, can you work together? Can you listen for the instructions of the games and things like that? So those are the areas that I cover. But for me first, it was physical. And once I got into the gym, Shannon, I could start looking at myself in the mirror again because I felt like I was skin and bones prior to my suicide attempt. My jackets were hanging off me. I was a shell of what I was. When I was competing, you know, in powerlifting and, and, you know, entertaining as a professional wrestler, excuse me, there's a bug here messing with me, it's almost <laughs> blowing my mouth. Uh, so yeah, for me, it was physical. And then I ended up with the spiritual and emotional, the mental aspect, um, and still working on the finances. Oh, me Those too. are the four steps. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like a lot of us are really still working on the finances because it's not the easiest thing to get a hold of, especially, um, you know, these days, but you're right. And I, and I love, uh, it's about having balance in your life and the yeah. exercise part. 
is not about what you look like, although it helps with our self-esteem to feel good in our clothes. Yes, and, it does. Um, but Most it's, in, yeah, it's endorphins. It's, uh, it's helping with our mental state by keeping the blood flowing, keeping your heart yes. healthy, keeping moving. Um, and it does really lift your, and just lifts your energy so that you have more energy to take, take on the day. Yes. Um, and then lastly, I just love to ask you about the role of faith because that's big for me too. Um, and how faith fits into your own healing and your own, uh, just evolution and, and continuing to prosper. It's big for me. And I never thought it would be because I, I was never, like I said, I grew up and you know, my, my former wife, her father was a Presbyterian minister. So we went to church every Sunday. So it wasn't like I wasn't getting access to, you know, being in a church, but faith is a whole different story. There could be a lot of people oh, yeah. sitting in church that really, when you <laughs> yeah. pull back some of the layers, there's not much on the way of faith. So that's, that's a, kind of a hard thing. But for me, you know, when, when I, again, when I stopped drinking, it seemed like things just kind of the conveyor belt started moving. I'm like, wait a minute, I don't, I'm not ready for this train to go. But yet it was God saying, okay, look, you, you know, I, I saved you. And if I saved you, I want you to help others. Uh, and again, I have to be careful when I'm operating in school, although, I mean, I'm a chaplain, but I can definitely walk that delicate balance in schools and not, you know, and, and there's, there's a bunch of news, you know, about they want to put the Ten Commandments in school and they want to, they want to do this and they want to do that. Now, being a chaplain, I'm understanding and respectful of other faiths. Yeah. So if you want to put the Ten Commandments in school, you got to consider everybody else's faith too. Right, exactly. Right? I mean, if you're going to do that, you got to be considerate of everybody. And although I'm a non-denominational Christian, I've got family members who are Muslim. I've got uh, former security colleagues who are Sikhi. I know folks who are Buddhists. I worked on a protection detail for a high priest, you know, for Buddhism. And I took a Buddhism class in my seminary training just so I can learn how to meditate, which I'm still a work in progress for me. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I've been, faith is my driver right now. It really is. And I don't necessarily feel like I have to quote a bunch of Bible scriptures. Uh, I've worked on my language and how I approach people. Uh, I'm still working on patience. That's, that's one that's, that's, you know, I'm still working on it, man. Patience, patience side. Be, be understanding of people. When they cut you off, just bless them. Don't yeah. <laughs> bother, don't bother at them. I had that lady who cut me off, Shannon, last week, and she flipped me the bird. I could barely <laughs> see her in a seat. She must have been like 90 years old. Oh and I just God. I blew a kiss at her. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was, perfect. It, was, it is hard. I, I did. I, so I tried to learning. do the same. Yeah, I try to do the same. It can be really hard, but I always think, okay, they're very angry. Um, I've had a lot of people lash out at me this year, and I feel like it's a like because of their stuff. And yeah. then I take yes, it very more personally. So than, than yeah, and I try to remember, okay, this person doesn't feel secure. This person doesn't right. feel safe. This person is in fear. So try to understand their position yes. and just love them as much as you can and pray for them, but <laughs> not in a, not in a condescending way, but in a real <laughs> way. And yeah. so I, I really appreciate that. And I also agree that, um, faith, whatever that looks like to you. And I say the same thing, you know, I'm a spiritualist. I have friends who are Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Muslim, whatever it is. Yes. I honor that as long as it's love as long as you're operating through love and the message yes. is love and caring for others please take what resonates and that's another reason why a lot of people are hesitant sometimes to go into 12-step recovery because they're like oh they're going to talk about god and i try to say it's not a real it's not relit in the religious sense it's a placeholder you yes. can say whatever you could whatever your universe source higher self just as long as you connect with something outside of yourself because as for example addicts or people who are dependent on alcohol or drugs or sex or whatever um we just have to learn that we're not in control and we and we try to manipulate and and make us and self-soothe with drugs or alcohol or numbing out and it's really about understanding that look we're not going to have control that's part of life and how can we learn to sort of ride the wave and yes bad things will happen but if we're constantly living in a state of fear 
it's we're we're getting in our own way and it's and i and i know that's easier said than done especially with ptsd um yeah. where your your brain is it's not a disorder but it's a hyper functioning of the brain saying well if something bad happened once so now i have to be hyper vigilant to prevent it from happening again and so i would just I, like to touch on that i know ptsd is a whole episode in itself um but the thing is it's trying to protect you but it's it's over functioning to the point where you can't function and so yeah, yeah if you'd just yeah, like to talk a little bit about that yeah <clears throat> excuse me yeah it's uh it, it it's a work i feel like it's a work in progress yeah. uh, i even talking to my kids first of all i i think people when you look at a church and i i talked about this at our church last week that the amount of young people that you have attending services is very important because it's not just that their parents are dragging them in but they they have access to some form of spirituality and a lot of people tell me and friend and you know people have told me that i you know that they are spiritual but not religious and it's it feels to me like sometimes the church is pushing people away and yeah. not bringing them into the fold and i know a lot of churches when we had the pandemic and we had the quarantine that you know people started going to zoom on church. And then when the quarantine and the pandemic was over with, people continue to do that. So these days, I don't know if people are drawn to church, but I believe they're definitely drawn to spirituality. So if we, you know, however we touch people, if we can touch them in a positive way. And, you know, and I, I got into this conversation with one of our coaches, because he was like, I know you're a minister, but is there a difference between ministering and mentoring? I said, wow, that's really insightful. I said, really, at the end of the day, it's a fine, minute line, but it could be the same. I mean, even though I'm mentoring to kids, I tell them, hey, look, let's be good sports here. Let's root on our team. Let's be understanding. Let's not, you know, rip somebody because they lose. In essence, that's a form of ministering as well. And I can do that without having to quote Matthew 7 or or Proverbs 8 or whatever. I don't have to do that. So I believe spirituality, it's it's difficult. Uh, and even with my own kids, I mean, I, you know, I and I talk and I know that, our, you know, when I was married, you know, we would drag our kids to church. I mean, because we were going, you're going to go. Yeah. Don't get, try to wait, get, get dressed, get, get breakfast because we're going. And, and kids, you know, they went reluctantly. But I do believe like spirituality and getting faith, it's it's very unique and it's a work in progress. Uh, because I mean, I just with young people, because I never thought I would be dealing with young people. I thought I would just be a chaplain at a cancer treatment facility, and then that would be it. But that little nugget in Pittsburgh of working with the high school kids has now turned into this groundswell of me working at all these different, last year I had 36 schools in seven districts in uh, Central California. This year it's a, it's down a little bit because of the funding for these after school programs. Because with COVID, there was a lot of funding, Shannon, given to schools to help with their social emotional learning. Kids really struggle when they went back to school because they had been so, isolated for such a long period of time now they're back in school and all these sort of things were going on kids had checked out and trying to get them back and there's cyber bullying and there's just so many things that are going on uh the funding i hope the funding doesn't dry up i hope they, they continue because kids need this they need addition to teachers teachers are great teachers are in demand but our coaches are a little bit younger and sometimes these kids will form bonds with our coaches because maybe they're a little bit closer in age than the teachers are so i, I don't even know if i answered that question because it was such a broad question it was but... so much in there but that you but what you said was really interesting and i i think that's important i just really want to encourage more funding for uh like you said support because school i know i was miserable in school and were you there was no yeah and like i 
it was just insecurity and shyness. And I was a selective mute kid who didn't talk and then just navigating all the social things. And I had yes. a great family. It wasn't my family. It was the right. kids and it affected my self-esteem for the rest of time. Mm. And, uh, and I really wish even just that, even just interpersonal conflict. Yes. So I think I was so young. I didn't really realize that I could have said to my friend, hey, I'm feeling really hurt by what you said, or, hey, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. There was just no conflict resolution, or how do I, you just kind of clam up because you don't know how to apologize or explain yourself or be understood or understand others. And it's like, and then add on all the things that kids might be going through at home with abuse, or I have friends that were abused and I never knew until we were adults. Yeah. Like they and didn't tell me. I tell our coaches that. I tell our coaches, look, you don't, and so where we're at in Monterey, um, you know, Salinas is like the salad bowl of America. It's huge ag here. I mean, it's, it runs all the way, you know, Monterey County is like really long. It runs stretches like 90 miles. And when you go down 101, that's all you see are these fields, these farms where these migrant folks are working and they work long hours. So I am sure I don't want to yeah. speak out of turn, but I think the kids aren't getting all the attention and right. all the love that they would be getting if, say, if a family worked nine to five job or whatever, but their families are working 12, 13, 14 hours. Yeah. And you can tell they cling to our coaches in these after school programs. And I tell our coaches, look, we got to watch out, you know, mandated reporter and touching kids inappropriately. I yeah. have to watch and kids want hugs. So yeah. I got to give them a side hug, you know, just to make sure that I don't get reported for anything. I sure. want desperately to hug these kids because they yeah. need it. They're not getting the attention and love. And it's not because it's neglect. It's because their no. parents are working these crazy They're in survival hours. mode. And, they're, and, it and, and it's, you know, people like me are struggling. And I always think about what about people who are legitimately poor, like in yeah. poverty? And how are right. they keeping a computer, having computers for their kids to study on or a an iPhone or just all of the things that we need, need, you know, for, to right. function, a car, vehicles. And I'm like, if I'm struggling, these people must be struggling. And so oh, they're in, working three jobs, seven days a week. And they yes. don't, just to feed their kids, they Absolutely. don't have anything left at the end of the day. So we yeah, need like people a, like you to be yeah. mentors and coaches. Like a couple of years ago, we we had come back from the Christmas break. And we had the kids uh, just write a little like what they got for Christmas and how their holiday was. And there was one young girl who had an empty page. And I was like, hey, you didn't write anything. What's going on? She was like, I didn't get anything. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I looked at the other coach and you could see her, her just her heart just drop. And, yeah. and that's we don't know. You know, they didn't yeah. have the money to give her anything. I felt so bad for her. You know, and I asked the principal, I think we ended up getting something for her, but I wanted to make sure what, if her parents thought it was okay. I didn't yeah. want to take liberties on doing this for this kid, but we don't know what's going on at home. They don't, you know, yeah. they're eating a lot. They're a lot of times they don't get to eat at home or whatever. So when there's action, I tell the lunch folks, please don't, let's not let kids throw a whole tray of food away. Because right. there might be some kids who want seconds. Yeah. And these cafeteria folks are like, oh, they can only do, I'm like, come on. Yeah, <laughs> them, I know. Some extra food, please. I'm just, yeah, I, the work you're doing is fantastic. And I think about how my best friend, one of my best friends when I was a kid, I didn't know her mother was an alcoholic till now. Like she never shared that with me. I didn't know that one of my other best friends was being abused at home by her borderline mother uh, and wow. being like locked out of her house barefoot foot in the middle of the night and not sleeping and having to go to school. So these are things that kids didn't even tell each other. So yes. it's so beautiful. And I just thank you so much for sharing your heart. Your just this message is important. And I'm excited to get it out there too, because it thank means you. a lot to me. And that... you opened up as well. Thank you for sharing your well, background. I appreciate that as well. Thank you. I, I think that when we have a dialogue about it and it's a conversation, where we feel safer to open up about our own yes. stuff. And so that's why I'm like, I have nothing to hide. If anyone wants to know anything, I will tell them anything because- Good for you, likewise. Shame, yeah, shame is an addict's worst enemy for one thing, but not even just addiction, like 
we need to talk about emotions and feelings right. more and how because we're human and this yes. culture really prioritizes hyper functioning and being uh driven and working and we work 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 i do it too and avoid yes. and then suddenly i'm in silence and i'm like oh i'm depressed <laughs> you know it's like we're yeah, not really absolutely. checking in with ourselves so um right. thank you for talking about mental health and thank you for just being a beautiful human being that is a light on this earth a lighthouse in this thank earth thank you so much and Ditto. i just yeah and i i just love you and i and will be uh, promoting this book and uh Good. I wish you all the best and keep, uh, Thanks, keep in touch too. Hey, where are yeah. you at? What's your book? How, how far along are you? I am probably a quarter way done with it after about okay. a year, but I'm pushing through because it's good for you. Yeah, yeah, it's just, I have an important message. And it's just like you said, every time you're writing about the past, you're like, oh my God, this is heavy. And I have to relive this and feel kind of process the emotions and also just keep in mind someone's reading this so don't make it too self-indulgent <laughs> you know yeah, it's like absolutely. it's like make it relatable and make it yes. so that they can go oh, i see myself in that um so i think also because we're recording right now i'll just say if anyone is wanting to share their story i think one of the most important things is just write everything get an editor yes. later um because yep. I'm, I'm sitting here going oh this feels so self-indulgent and i don't want to me 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 but it is important to share your story whether it's Absolutely. in a book format, at a storytelling event, on a podcast, yes. to your yes. friends, um, just share your stories because that's what connects us. And I think that's what the most beautiful thing. Um, and that's, that's why I love podcasting. It's connecting. It's connection. I, it is. It yeah, is. Good so. for you. And you're really good at what you do. Thank you, you so much. Fantastic. So are you. Thank you so much. Um, this has just been awesome. And I... Uh, I'm just going to end it in a formal way, which is like, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Chaplain Sai <laughs> Ali will have all the links below and your book. And you are just a beautiful soul. Thank you. Back at you. Thank you.